at some point you could connect your Commodore 64 to the network to do all these beautiful things that I will tell you about in a moment. So yes, uh, that network originally was designed to run on a very specific hardware. Eventually the company realized a big mistake that they made, excluding all the other people who had wonderful hardware at home, and they produced special adapters for computers such as C64 to access the, the network. So what I will tell you, first of all, I will explain to you what that Net Naboo network was about. And then I will tell you about uh, why we decided to reconstruct it. And whether we, are, we succeeded or not. Probably we did because we have a demo. And, and some other interesting things. So first of all, the name Nabu, it's an ancient uh, Babylonian god of wisdom and writing. And the company that decided to do Nabu Network assumed the name, Nabu Manufacturing, hoping that also Nabu will be for the, the maker of money and a lot of money. So that's, uh, that's the connection with the Nabu. Now, when we started the reconstruction project, we also uh, assumed that Nabu will help us to finish it because they got the wisdom and writing. So, and we needed that desperately. You'll we'll see in a moment why. Okay. So first of all, why dealing with reconstructions? Uh, for me here is to, like preaching to, to a choir. Uh, uh, I don't need to explain the significance of uh, uh, history of computing and the significance of taking care of your uh, heritage, uh, especially as far as technology is concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that I don't need to do but this is sort of a general purpose presentation that I'm throwing occasionally at various crowds, so I have to do things like, you know, it's useful because you can learn so much. First of all, you preserve uh, things for future generations and so to keep the continuity, uh, but also via reconstructions you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot, lot about hardware, you can learn a lot about software, and then you can uh, show it uh, uh, on a display and people are very, very amazed how men, how wonderful things you could do with a piece of string and a piece of, uh, I mean, yeah, a piece of wire and a piece of wood, that would be a telephone that comes to my mind. So, yeah, you can make a phone calls using that type of technology. So, as I said, I'm so happy and lucky that I don't need to do uh, a longer introduction uh, let me only mention that a number of museums of uh, science are involved in uh, reconstruction projects. Now, this looks like a small, tiny thing, but this is one of the Babbage's second uh, analytical, uh, analytical machine uh, reconstructed uh, in the Science Museum in London. Uh, when you visit London, you can see that. It's a huge monster, several tons, and you can see some of the dimensions. Uh, uh, 8,000 parts. And that was a very long-term project. Probably you remember that Babbage, who in the 19th century was designing these machines for the purpose of actually printing mathematical tables. That was the idea. Yeah, people loved mathematical tables, but they contained errors, and these errors could do nasty things. Not only your bridge could collapse, but your ship can, uh, can, can go down, you can kill people. And, and, and Babbage actually calculated, he applied for a first grant. He calculated how much money the UK government was losing because of errors in mathematical tables. Because the tables were, first of all, you had to compute data by hand, then you had to enter the data during typesetting by hand. All of that created errors. What he wanted to do was to build a machine that would do everything in an automated way. He failed to manufacture these things. So this is why, but it was important, so this is why Brits decided to rebuild it. All the plants, design plant, plants uh, survived, and that's the reconstruction. It's a beautiful piece of, uh, of machinery. This is, these knobs, you had to turn them in order to add. Uh, this is a differential machine. It's an interesting principle of the basis of which these calculations were done. And in, in, in his writings, Babbage was saying that ideally that would be powered by steam or small dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine the dogs running in the carousel and powering that thing. Uh, so that's uh, one of the uh, reconstructions. 
this is an interesting thing because probably this is uh, the earliest example of electronic digital computing device, not a computer, because there, there, are, there, there are some problems. Well, everything, of course, depends on the definition. But definitely, it was computing uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff. So it was not general purpose, it was special purpose, and mostly differential equations, but you see these vacuum tubes here. Uh, again, this is very early, 1937-38, Tanta Nasov and his student Barry were working on it. Then Second World War interrupted the construction. There were some calculations done on it, so it's valid. And, and then it disappeared, it was dismantled, gone. So a group of researchers decided to rebuild it using original, actual original vintage uh, uh, parts. And here it is. Uh, now you can test some of the hypotheses. Many historians were disputing whether you could do anything useful. But now you have that machine, you can try it, yes? So these claims can be verified. Zusser, Konrad Zusser, German engineer, again, before the Second World War, was designing a variety of computers. These were mostly electromagnetic, so switches, telephone switches. And, and again, most of these uh, did not survive the Second World War. Again, a reconstruction effort in Germany to rebuild it. This is uh, German heritage. Now, on American scene, if you go to California, to Mountain View, if you visit Computer uh, History Museum, among various things, you will see the reconstruction of PDP-1, one of the first, well, the first computer from digital equipment. Uh, and uh, it's among the most popular exhibits because it runs uh, in space for the original game. And so you can see the process of loading the game through the tape, and children can play using the original joysticks. It's a lot of fun. Very, very interesting uh, display. Okay, uh, so why doing that? Sense of responsibility. Yes, because you can, you have the expertise, and there is the technology that is rusting. Yeah, you should really uh, do that. Then the sense of urgency. Um, reconstruction can be successful if you have an occasion to talk to people who were involved in these projects. This is essential. You will see in a moment that how important it was uh, for our reconstruction project. And of course, these original parts, if you want to have an original reconstruction, uh, they are harder and harder to find. <coughs> so let me tell you now what's that number network all about. And that idea uh, uh, appeared to John Kelly Around 79, 78, uh, 1980, he bought a little tiny company and that was doing actually a TV adapters or something like that. And realized that everybody in North America is doing it. So for a company to survive, they had to produce something else. And through brainstorming, uh, he arrived at the conclusion that the best thing would be to join two technologies. One, microcomputers. And uh, around 1980, if you remember, especially consumer electronic market was getting crazy. They really desperately tried to sell us more and more of these things called home computers. And indeed, they were selling by hundreds of thousands, eventually a million a year, like common writing in 1983. So there were lots of these things, and it looked for a moment that everybody can make money by designing some kind of microcomputer and selling uh, these microcomputers to the public. <coughs> Nabu wanted to, 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 to do that as well, but they looked at another technology, cable. And Canada was and still is one of the most cabled countries in the world. Something like 80% of uh, households uh, have an access to cable, and out of that, maybe 70% are actually using cable. So, and similar stories in the US. Now, cable offered one thing that at that time phone lines, radio could not. Uh, reliable high-speed uh, 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 transmission of information. And what they wanted to do is to combine technology to create a network where a home computer user will just connect to a network and will get all these goodies. And these were not only games, but all sorts of application programs, services. Is it me? <laughs> okay. uh, services and, and, and so on. Uh, not by a phone, so don't talk, think about your BBS systems when you have to connect and wait until midnight where rates will cheap and so on and so on. <laughs> and then you'll be waiting for hours until uh, the page will, uh, will load. 
Now we are talking about very high speed. And just to mention how high that <coughs> speed was, it was 6.2 mega, megabits per second. The transmission. So you could afford to send to a user 60K uh, uh, program of size 60K or 100K. There was no problem. It would take a second. So what Nabu wanted in the first place, there they had three uh, stage plan. So in stage one, what they wanted to do is to, to have users connected to the network locally. So there would be a TV cable provider that will be uh, that will be taking care of all the application program for you. I will, I will show you briefly the architecture of that thing in a moment. But think about the cable TV provider having some sort of a server and is serving all the prog programs and, uh, and, 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 and services that you may need to your personal computer via, via PC. But everything we think will be local and only one way, so you could receive, but you could not send anything. So that was phase one. In phase two, <laughs> Again, local communities, and Nabu network here, Nabu network there. So one may be in Ottawa, one in Toronto, one in, in, in Japan. Uh, but that would be two-way now. So you could talk to everybody interconnected within that community. And you could connect uh, something like 10,000 uh, customers to a single uh, cable provider. But we're talking about large communities. So they could send emails, you could uh, they order your tickets and so on. It was two-way, you could do telebanking and so on. So that was phase two, but it's fantastic what they wanted to do in phase three is to interconnect these uh, local networks. So now you can connect to anybody anywhere in the world uh, who was using Nabu network. So sending messages, emails, and so on, it, it doesn't matter as long as your uh, as your uh, as a person. Uh, who you wanted to com uh, communicate was sitting on some number network somewhere. And these very servers would be communicating with each other via satellite. And they started to build the technology. Actually, this is the name of the pro 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 project. And in 1983, you'll see in a moment, when they were demonstrating that technology to the cable TV conference, um, they, they actually did that trick. So that was the show was taking place in Calgary. They had 100 Nabu terminals, so they had 100 users, and they were uh, interacting with Nabu network server, which was in Ottawa via satellite. So that was 83. So if you look at phase three, what they are talking about, they are talking about uh, worldwide web in 1983, so it's something like 10 years before World War II. Yes. So that's what's Nabu Network uh, from the... Uh, um, in, in, in general, I will tell you a little bit about uh, the architecture, how to accomplish these things, but this was really, this was brilliant. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a reason for using microcomputers because they saw the trend. There was a reason to, to be hooked up to cable because, as I said, it was fast, and cable providers, cable providers in the early 1980s were using something like one, one third of a bandwidth. Uh, they had no idea what to do with the rest. So you could say and say, how about you put Nabu Network on it? Yes, it would bring you money and so on. And, and, and uh, so the idea was to convince the first few, and the market, the cable TV market was so competitive that if one guy had it, everybody else had to have it. So the timeline, just to give you what, what, what it was, so 82, the network was announced. And if you look at Nabu network as sort of electronic distribution of software, because so far the only way to get a software, you could go to, to a store and it would be nicely packaged, and you would buy it on a cartridge, on a tape, on a floppy. Uh, what really Nabu network was representing was a different way of, the, of software distribution, electronically. That was not a novel idea. Some other people also had that idea, maybe not in the form of a network, but there was a games network and there were some other uh, similar activities. Even in the UK, perhaps started all of that. Uh, so it was interesting that in '82, actually a number of companies announced some ideas for, for electronic distribution of software. So you have 83, I mentioned that, uh, that conference in, in Calgary. In October, the network was uh, launched in Ottawa. 
cable vision. Uh, it is in a year later in Alexandria, in Virginia. That was not really a huge thing, but as I said, they wanted to, to catch attention of other, uh, other cable vision subscribers. I think Ottawa had uh, 83, around 80,000 subscribers, so it was a decent market. <laughs> then in 85, they, they, they signed a collaboration with ASCII Corp Corporation to install network in Japan. And in 86, everything was over. Please do ask me why if I, if I miss that. Pardon me? So why? Oh, really? Okay, so let's say... That's the channel architecture. So let me briefly tell you how it works because it was an interesting idea, especially with phase one. This is mostly what was implemented. So in 83, when I said it was launched, so it was launched, with phase one was launched. So you have only one way. However, when you are using the system, you have impression that you are actually communicating with Nabu Network. You say, send me this, and that thing is being sent, and the system is uh, asking for a password, you are sending a password, it goes. So how did that work when everything was just one way? So this is, this is I think, an interesting trick. Uh, so here's the, this part is a TV provider side, and this is a home user, uh, Nabu Network user side. So on the, uh, on the cable TV side, what do you have? You have a server, which is head-end computer, this is how it was called, and some, of course, uh, uh, circuitry to combine and to encrypt, and basically everything is being sent or fed to cable. Then you had to have an adapter uh, that uh, makes sense of a cable TV signal and sends all the information to your home computer, which is connected to Commodore display, yes? Uh, joystick, keyboard, printers, and so on. That home computer originally was Nabu PC. Nabu also designed and manufactured a dedicated computer. And uh, that was standalone computer. So you could use it uh, for other things as well. You don't need to, you didn't need to connect it necessarily to the network. Now, so what was the magic? And I, 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 as I say, everything is downstream. Nothing goes up. So how would you say, I want to play a game, or I want to do, I want to pay my bill, or something? And uh, the trick was this. So via cable, what you had, you had everything that the provider had was sending down the street in a cycle. Since it was high speed, the cycle was around 15 to 20 seconds, every single piece of software would be traveling in a cycle. So if you say, Oh, I want to uh, use Logo to write some Logo programs. Because programming languages were on the on Nabu Network as well. Basic Logo and other things. So if Logo were here, your computer has to wait. So basically your adapter would be watching. You were really communicating with adapter. You would say to adapter, hey, I want Logo. And adapter would say, okay, wait a minute. As soon as I see it, I will grab it and give it to you. So here it is, it rotates, okay, logo is coming, take it, send it. So this is how it was. Then you say, I want to play a certain game, and, and again, uh, uh, you have to wait until your game arrives, and you, 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 you take it. So uh, if, you, if you check out a demo, you will see that. You, you are inter... You, you are inter uh, uh, you are engaged in a very interesting um, telecommunication with, uh, with the network, but everything really goes, goes one way. So even when, we, when, even when the system is asking for a password and you type the password, this is done in the same way because one of these slots is occupied by information about every single user and every single password. So. An adapter is that guy who protects not you, but Nabu Network. So when the adapter sees that either the password is not right, or you have no right for, to, for that software, because you haven't paid uh, for that type of programming, there were, there, were, there were types of programming you could have. The basic programming is like in TV uh, these days. Uh, I don't want, so what can I say about it? This is how I imagine. 
uh, cable works, that you can subscribe to basic services, and if you want more, then you have to pay more. The same was, was with Naboo, it was a paid service. You could do, get the basic things, however, if you had to pay for, I don't know, some spreadsheet and database programs, and you request a, data a specific database program, and the adapter will, says, will, will check if you have a right to that program, if you pay. And everything was updated every minute or so. So really, that was a uh, very well-designed system. But this is how really it worked. So you were interacting with, yes? How long is one of the cycle? 15 seconds to 20, depending on how, how, how many of these applications programs there were. They did the testing, and they said, as I mentioned earlier, you could put 10,000 people on the same cycle, and nobody will notice. Uh, and the reason for that was that uh, even if the program was 100k, it was divided into 1k pieces. So you, you, you would be grabbing 1k piece at a time, because, because the communication between adapter and computer was much, much slower than, than the transmission speed. So not only the software was divided into 1k, but also spaced, so that if you grab the first piece and send it to the computer, the wheel would get here, just in case to grab the second piece of the software. So everything was very nicely coordinated, so that you really don't see any, any delays. <coughs> so the first program that, that, that was grabbed, and it was not your choice, this is how everything was arranged. So the ROM chip in the adapter was always looking for the main menu program. So you turn on the system, and if the password was OK, uh, the system automatically will, will boot your, 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 your PC to a main menu. This is how it looked like, but this is one of the menus, because Nabo produced several menus, but this is the one that we have, and I will tell you later on what's significant about it. So what, basically what you see, you see the main categories of application programs. Network services, so these are for services, like an education channel, that was controlled by teachers in Ottawa area. They were running and managing it. So it was a very nice community. There were around 20 schools running or connected to Nabu Network doing all sorts of uh, educational programming. Family fun, simple games, maybe a hundred. Uh, world of games, more advanced games. And uh, home management is where you will have your databases, spreadsheets, and, and so on and so on. Uh, if you wanted more categories, yeah, you could get more categories by, by not everything, is, there is a key which says next page, next page, and you will have all these categories. What's interesting, help is obvious, exit is obvious, shortcut, this is your Google search. So you could, you could search for keywords in, in names of applications, programs, and in that way you could access gauge faster and so on and so on. So it's a, a primitive search engine that was uh, uh, available. So when you selected, uh, what did we select here? Educational channel, number two. Then you have subcategories of it. Or maybe right away application programs. But, but so it's a tree structure. So in educational you have uh, language arts, art, computer languages, computer skills, computer tools, and more and more and more. Then you go again to one of these categories like computer languages and like Pascal, basic, logo, and so on. When you select basic, basic will be loaded to your computer. And then you can use it. Uh, and as I said, initially uh, it was designed for Nabo PC, but eventually you could connect any of these. I know all that, but I haven't seen any of these adapters. And it's interesting that among the software that we have, there is a main menu and a few application programs for C64. And uh, Nabu PC is Z80 based machine. So it's nothing to do with 65 or 2. Therefore we can't read it. I don't know how uh, C64 menu looked like. I don't know what kind of software was offered because we have no way I can connect physically in principle connect C64 to our uh, uh, network but what you need is an adapter and so it looks like a good research program and project if you're interested I will be very very happy to uh, to talk about this I have some information some technical information but definitely some hacking is involved to have it uh, uh, run and it's very easy to measure the success either the, the thing will boot to C64 menu or will not 
But eventually this will be available. This is how an ABO PC looks like. Uh, it's a, it looks like a stereo equipment. So it's an ABO PC and this box is an ABO adapter. That's the one that talks to the cable. The content. Uh, well, that, that business of sending all these application programs to uh, consumers via cable, uh, its success depends on what kind of stuff you have, what kind of programming you can offer. Now you can talk, we will say, oh, we'll be sending games. But you play a game and after a month you have enough of that, you would like another game. So it means that a lot, a lot of things have to be continuously developed. So, and, and that was expensive. See, uh, talking about why it collapsed. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this is the time when everybody was playing Pac-Man. You had to have Pac-Man. But Nemco says, well, we'll not sell it because we're not interested in developing Pac-Man for for Z80, if you want it, you can develop it yourself. But the license will cost you fifty thousand dollars. So they paid fifty thousand just for the right to develop Pac-Man, which actually they did a very good job. You can play it here. So the content, uh, they were buying it from software publishers, and they were de developing a long, a lot of stuff in uh, in house. And typical application, so you have education. What's an elephant? Yes, everybody says, what's an elephant? Ah, now you have display. Oh, that's elephant. That's, that's really education. Uh, and of course, the idea that uh, the only way, useful way, a housewife can use a computer is by storing recipes. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the idea. So, Nabu uh, reconstruction project. So, you know something about Nabu. What happened when the Nabu collapsed? in 86. Uh, they installed the Nabu network in three places, Japan, Ottawa, and Alexandria. So when they closed, basically there were three copies of the network. I'm talking about software. So when they closed, everything disappeared. So there was no software, a little bit of hardware, but not much. So everything was gone. And uh, so first of all, our, our museum is dedicated to Canadian uh, computing industry. And uh, Nabu Network sound like a fantastic idea. No, nobody tried that before. I wanted to see how it looked like. I could not because none of the museums in Canada would have Nabu Network. So I said to a friend of mine, Bill Kendrick, who was very instrumental in the uh, in, uh, successful conclusion of this project. So I said, how about we build one? Okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, you say you drink beer and you never know whether you will survive. That idea will survive these two bottles of beer. But it did. So, significance, one, the second, the second reason that nobody did that, and that, uh, that was sort of our mandate as a university, uh, as, a, as a, a Canadian museum, and, uh, and we wanted to do that. So Nabu object, the project objectives, as I said, nothing was done. So first of all, we had to compete. So we had to collect as much as we can. There was no problem with collecting hardware, but there was no software. So we, we faced the possibility of actually writing everything ourselves. It took them two years with 500 employees, and there were just two of us. Uh, and of course, we wanted to do it historically as accurate as possible. Otherwise, why doing it? It will be just our version. Now, better reconstruction from software side should include many things such as operating system that uh, Nabu PC was using to communicate, to, to operate with the network. The main menu program was, is a big piece of uh, uh, software. And also applications programs. We, we could not find any. So there was, there was nothing, in terms of software, nothing was available. And of course, we wanted to document everything just in case uh, we would uh, run out of money and it would collapse and there would be a new group working on it in 20 years. At least they will have everything documented as opposed to our situation. So what was the good news? The good news was that we had the, the, uh, there, was, there, there is a lot of uh, newspapers and popular magazines uh, with articles about Nabu. But, but these are information, oh, John Kelly bought this or sold that, but no technical information that we could use. And there was no problem with finding hardware. So Nabu PCs and even development systems uh, that were relatively easy to locate in Ottawa and, and to get them. 
But the bad news was nothing technical. There was just one uh, manual that was describing the operating system in general terms. Uh, but nothing else, no technical documentation, no manuals, no nothing, absolutely nothing. No software, no nothing. So, what do you do when you don't have really anything to work with? I remember general idea, of course, of course you had some uh, uh, accounts, how easy or how convenient it was to use Unabu Network, but nothing really specific. So, what one does? So, <coughs> first thing that we did, uh, we look at ROMs, and Nabu PC has a ROM, and Nabu Adapter has a ROM, and, and these ROMs contain a lot of interesting information. So first of all, they contain communication protocol, the way they were communicating, give me this, no I can't because you, your password does not work, and so on. All the communication, uh, and treasures such as original Nabu logo was there, and many other things. So that was, that was hard work, but eventually we did that and we extracted a lot of information. Uh, and uh, as I said, there was one uh, document for uh, to start the operating system. But uh, at some point, very strange things uh, started to help us. Uh, Nabu, uh, when it loads an application program, I told you that it loads 1K by 1K. Every successful load of that module will raise the tone up, so you see going up. And if some, there are some bugs, it will stay flat. So suddenly debugging our programs and so on, this audio information was very, very important, especially for communication when we were still uh, trying to decipher the communication protocol, whether we were getting things right or wrong. These audio signals present, uh, generated by, uh, by Nabu PC, that was, that was very, very useful, but are quite unexpected. And then, uh, of course, there are engineers around, so that was, that was the most uh, important thing for us to find, to locate these people, and to get as much information, technical information about the Nabu network as possible, and they were indeed very helpful. So here it is, so what we did, yes, so what we did, the first step, the first step was of course to write the, the general operating software, the uh, OS, and then the main menu. Now, even, even we, we, we didn't even have any, I, clear idea how, how that system looked like from graphical point of view. So in one of the uh, manuals for Nabu PC, you, you, you had that picture. And apparently, that was the main menu. Look how different it is from the previous one that I showed you. These are the categories, family, games, education, personal, product, productivity. It's a different menu uh, published in, uh, in, uh, as I said, in, in the manual. So, that was the only information about menu that we had. We said, oh yeah, yeah, there are categories. So it looks like a tree structure. So let's simulate that. There's shortcut. We knew what that meant. We know what help is and exit. So this is our reconstructed thing. The only difference is that instead of Nabu, we have Yun, which is York University Nabu Network Guide, rather than the Nabu Network Guide. And these are the categories that we, uh, we implemented. So we used every single bit of information that, uh, that we could get. Now, these are other menus. This is later on we learned about Nabu experimenting. This is also an early menu, and this is yet another version of the menu. So we didn't even know which one eventually was being sold to customers. <coughs> I mentioned the operating system, so I will not get to that. Uh, testing. So we did, we, 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 at some point we finished it, and now we say, okay, have we succeeded or not? In what way this is? historically accurate or successful. So we desperately needed a piece of software. And we learned that Nabu sold one game to that ASCII corporation in Japan. And that was, uh, Nabu called it uh, Mania. And, uh, and MSX version of it was called Pelitan, Helicopter Tank. And that Japanese version for MSX still exists and you can download the ROM, which we did. But it's an MSX. It's a close architecture, but it's not the same. So we spent something like a month reverse engineering it, basically cleaned up uh, Mania and put it into the system, and it worked. So we were really amazed that uh, whatever we did, uh, we did right. There was one guiding principle that all the engineers are telling us that uh, the system was so complicated that uh, every solution that we used had to be as simple as possible. So this was our guiding principle. Keep everything simple rather than, you know, 
don't go for optimization set anyway. It did work. So what was uh, achieved? Yes, we wrote a software menu, found a uh, piece of software, wrote a few programs, educational programs, to have something to show, and basically that's it. And we started to showing the, 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 this thing uh, around. And this is another interesting thing. I think this is good marketing and what marketing can do to you. So when everything was done, we, we had an official unveiling at York in April, but th then we took it to a special event NABU event organized by Canada Science and Technology Museum in November of the year. And, and I have a few pictures, so that's from, from your. Uh, that's uh, Bill Kendrick who helped uh, with the project. This is John Kelly, the, the creator, the founder. Uh, this is the uh, head end computer, that's the server, yes, connected to the PC. And so some of it, these are former engineers uh, of NABU quite curious what we did with, uh, with the server. And that's NABU event in Ottawa, that's again John Kelly, uh, uh, Leo Binkowski was, he is the guy who implemented Pac-Man and most important games. This is one of the managers as well. These are some of the engineers from NABU that came to be, and it was really very, very good. And I'm showing you to not only how, how, how successful we were, but one of these guys, which I can't recognize, came to me and he said, you know what, it's, everything is very nice, you've done a very good job, and, and it's so terrible. You see this with Harry Tank, which is the only game that we reverse the genome. It's terrible that you don't have that original software. And I, you know, in my garage, there's that box. <laughs> yeah, there's that box with floppies, you see, and uh, it says Nabu on it. Maybe it, you, maybe you find it useful. Oh my God. Now, Exactly. What it what happened was that before Nabu closed, some guy with our, 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 our came to the conclusion that we had to make a backup. And the entire software, the entire programming, the entire cycle as they call it, all the application programs around 1985, 84, 85, it was there. So, so, th so this is well, yeah. So this is what I'm saying is yeah, you do a little bit of marketing and things do happen. And so obviously the next day, yes, we, we copied these floppies and run, not, nothing, 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 nothing was working. And, and, and then there was a stupid thing. It was uh, almost Y2000 probably. Um, and Nabu menu, the new one that they were using, it was sort of uh, looking at clock, at the clock, the real clock, and sort of comparing and there was a disagreement. It didn't work. So you had to pretend that it was 1985, basically. This is what fixed. Did it fix? Everything worked. Wow. And not only that we have all the games and all the application programs on Nabu, but, but what was available in Ottawa, there were things such as uh, cultural uh, events, uh, wine guide, but you had all sorts of information about wines, restaurants, sports, and so on. It's a huge resource just to dig. If someone is interested in culture in general, everything is there. It's just amazing, amazing what we found and what we are still finding. Uh, so thank, thanks, Nabu, this way I brought it back because indeed it, it delivered. So for return of Nabu, this is this what I just told you. So briefly, uh, I'm about to end. Uh, the next thing, of course, is to make, yeah, that, what we have here in the corner is the only copy of it. So if something happens, a fire or something, it's gone again. Uh, fortunately, we decided to build an emulator, and so we can run the entire the network um, on, uh, on the PC. So it's an emulation. Uh, probably I will, I will make this into a C64 display. <laughs> <laughs> So it's one of the games, and uh, a few more shots. Uh, oh, wow. So Nabu, this is how Nabu puts, and I really invite you to, to the presentation. This is how the wine uh, uh, guide uh, starts. This is my 2049er uh, game by Leo Binkowski. So this, this is the typical graphics of the, of the late, early 1980s. Uh, acknowledgements, many people thank us. I'd like to thank again Bill, uh, my friend, who helped me with that. And, uh, and uh, but many many other people, these are the engineers who helped us in getting information. And uh, here's our museum. So if you want to read more about the project and 
board screenshots and, and so on, or some other information about other activities uh, in our museum. This is the, this is the site. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Now that you've done that kind of crime, have you guys been hired to do any other kind of systems now? Well, believe me, this is my hobby, yes? <laughs> I pay for my bread with some other type of activity, so I don't have time for anything else. I wish I could spend more time on that. And, uh, we did another, another um, uh, uh, software and hardware construction project of probably the earliest microprocessor-based Canadian hardware which is 1972. I'm not talking the first personal computer, which is MCM70 that I did research on. I'm talking about a computer that happened a little bit earlier. It was not designed for personal use, but nevertheless, it was microprocessor based and actually was running on Canadian first microprocessor, which makes it even more interesting. So we, we have finished that project this year. So we do uh, uh, reconstruct things that are almost gone. And again, if you would like to at least try uh, the C64 adapter for the network, it would be really, really nice. Because as I said, the wet cycle contains C64 material that cannot be accessed by us. It produces noise. What we need is an interface to make uh, uh, that code translated into uh, C64 machine language. Because that information on the cycle, this is not basic code. Uh, that Z8 instruction code. Yes. yes. Uh, so you mentioned during the talk that the company's demise was sort of financial issue. I was wondering if you can talk a bit more about that. Well, first of all, the crucial thing was to convince the critical mass of cable TV providers to install NABU network. And, and I think this is where the company failed. And to give you some idea, at that time, and right now as well, Rogers was the king of cable. And they had an agreement, signed agreement, that they will have test runs of NABU network in, in Vancouver in, in 1983. And Roger said, you get 1,000 uh, subscribers, we install that immediately in Vancouver in Toronto. That would be go. Canada, the entire Canada will be NABU network. They failed do, to do that, and they say for many reasons, because it was such a huge demand for PCs in Ottawa that they could not send enough on time to Vancouver. I don't think it's true. I think they, 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 they screwed up on this one. That was a big thing. They would have Rogers, they would solve, the, uh, solve that thing. Another mistake was, think about this, they are starting in, am I running out of time? Okay. A, you have 1980, yes, you have a company with a brilliant idea, we'll, to, we'll do the network talking to, to home computers. Which home computer? Which platform? There's no IBM PC on the market yet. So what you have? You have Z80s, very popular platform. You have uh, these Commodores. So what? Uh, there was no clear indication which way to go. So they decided to go for the most popular processor, Z80, for the most popular operating system, which is CPM. And they start developing it. It took them two years, two and a half years. What happened during that time? IBM arrived in 81, changed the game totally. CPM lost to Microsoft DOS during that time, yes, because of IBM PC, among other things. So suddenly, when they were ready with their PC, nobody really wanted to take a look at this as a, as a viable personal computer, basically, period. On the other hand, if they decided to, uh, to go for IBM PC type of platform, 86, it would be a different story entirely. Uh, because there were lots of people, who, I'm quite sure that in Vancouver they had, there were a lot of people in 83 who had either IBM PC or one of the clones. There would be no problem with finding 100 people with computers. So sometimes a little bit of luck, a little bit of help from the Nabu, the god of wisdom and writing. And, and it was very, this is what they lost. As I said, if they bet on on, on uh, Intel uh, microprocessor, and then they will have no problem with the PC revolution. They will be big. And then, they, they, because they were developing so many things at the same time, they basically ran out of money. They had to develop content, they, had to, they were developing the satellite uh, technology, and, and, and they, were, they were very successful because of the demos and so on. So they were spending a lot of money. They burned something like $40 million by 1985, 
and, uh, and in one of the articles, uh, press articles, I read that Nabu lost the confidence of investors. After burning $40 million, nobody else wanted to put another 10 or 20. Uh, so that's, that, that's the story. This is how it is. Sometimes you are first and you are paying for this. IBM is always second or third. And this was when they ended with their mainframes. They were not first. They were sort of forced to do it. The same with PCs. They went in, they, they waited and saw what happened with Apple II and so on and so on. It's not a bad strategy. Typically, it's an awful strategy to be the first. This is what happened to Nabu. This is what happened to Canadian MCM and MCM 70. I'm pointing uh, in this direction because there are, over there are my books when you can read everything about it. You pay for being the first with an excellent product. And, and the same with, with these uh, cable TV providers. Well, let somebody else try it. We'll see if it works, if people are hot. And if they do, yeah, we'll install them. Yes. Is there any connection between Nabu and the Teledyne? Well, uh, superficial. Uh, yeah, but Teledyne was, was working on, on telephone lines, so you had transmission problems. You had to sp uh, write special protocols and special programs to deal with graphics before because of the slow transmission. And, and they were not into software distribution, so they didn't want to sell you games and uh, programming languages. They didn't want to be an educational tool for schools. What well, basically uh, information uh, books and so on. Yeah. But at the beginning, Nabu was saying, yeah, we offer you Teledon and more. So that's, that's uh, there is the connection. And this is apparently another, perhaps another reason for the collapse. Uh, Teledon, or Teletech in general, Teletech, the idea of sending information to to your TV set. Uh, that was a huge thing in Europe. Uh, some interest in the US, but nobody made, nobody made, made money out of that. And TV providers knew that. So perhaps people were saying, OK, you have a teletech-like service. And let's, let's have a people experiment. But let's see what happened now. Yeah, you go to a hotel like this one. I don't know how many of you are staying. You turn on the TV and boots to the uh, hotel service. And you have an access to internet, games, this, movies, and so on. That's your Nabu. You fly and you have your entertainment center. You do movies, and do that, do that, do that. It's your Nabu in an airplane. So that idea eventually resurfaced. Oh, it's like the Apple TV. Or, yeah, know, exactly, the exactly. Internet. And it was very remarkable that note because uh, Nabu even did animation movies which were available. So you could. You could, you could do, you, do you have them? No, I don't. No. Oh, no. In the museum? Uh, are they in the museum? Uh, no, it did no. not survive. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a. What was the. Boy, jo Bo Boy George or George Boy? Boy George. Boy George. Yes. 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 And they, what, his group was called Culture Club or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. some people, especially programmers, Nabu were crazy about it. And there was a concert in Ottawa. So they filmed that entire concert and they digitized it uh -huh. and, and put it on the Nabu. Uh, Network. So you could see the concert in, well, digitized, meaning yeah. these, you know, these uh, graphics were made of bricks at that time, yes, brick of color red, brick of color green, and so on. But nevertheless, you had your boy George doing all these things for two hours. This is what they did. So, so they were really experimenting with all sorts of media. They knew that they were right. As I said, the, uh, looks like the society was not ready. And Nabu made uh, a number of serious mistakes and didn't get lucky. This is what it is. And that's Bill uh, Hindry. Thank you, Bill, again for your help. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you are very welcome to, to see the demo. And Bill, there will be demo.